Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to start my talk tonight where I think every single story of every person ultimately starts, and that's family. Here's mine. I was born and raised in a absolutely quintessential black American family that deeply appreciated a few core values. First and foremost, the importance of hard work. Secondly, the idea of having a strong ethical ambition in service to an important cause. And then third, having a deep appreciation for the notion that with great, with great privilege necessarily comes a very deep responsibility to carry the baton forward in each of our own unique ways. One can say that the road to achievement and excellence in my family was relatively consistent for much of my family. So everyone older than me, so my older sibling, Julian, and my parents, all went to Harvard and Yale for their uh, degrees, and additionally hold postgraduate degrees in rather conservative fields, namely law and theology. Scholastic achievement, one could say very obviously, was a core value pillar for my family. I, however, had a very different orientation to how I wanted to find success, how I wanted to find respect amongst my peers. White society at large, of course, deeply, value, deeply appreciates scholastic achievement, and rewards individuals who manage to perform very well in formal settings such as this. But for me, in my heart, I wanted to pursue a new path, and in my experience, I ended up having to do this on my own because it's proved, proved to be undefined territory for my family. I am, as you can see here, a bit more of an uh, adventurer, you could say. Always have been, always will be. And now I find myself three decades in and having found my way into the tech scenes of North, West and East Africa. And despite being black and not African and not having any connections at all when I started off in this project. I'm now currently based out of Kenya and I run a financial technology company that serves African, African banks across the continent. In my journey going from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to Nairobi, Kenya, and weaving throughout Africa, I came to discover that I really couldn't actually find a perfect fit for certain traits that seemed uniquely disadvantageous in the wrong context, say in the US, but it was those very traits that proved to be the keys to my success in the right context. I realized that there are different problems in the world, and different problems by definition require different expertise. And I think that fundamentally this means that the world itself relies on each of us having what I call the audacity to lean into our own truth and find where can we be the exact puzzle piece to solve a particular problem that we care about? When we assume that a certain profile is the only one that is the best to solve any particular problem, in my view, we fail to realize our true humanity. We risk forcing ourselves into situations where we think that we have to do something based upon convention, and not because we have very deliberately evaluated that this particular route that we're choosing is actually the most efficient one. So today I'm here to share with you a few stories that I collected in my journey throughout Africa. And my hope is that by the end of the talk, whoever you are or whatever makes you unique in your view, you will feel the encouragement to unabashedly lean into that because those are very likely to be the very traits that you need to be successful in your own right. Ever since I was 10 years old, um, I wanted to venture off into foreign lands, engage in different cultures, and connect with people who were solving uh, especially problems in emerging market economies. Now, that of course was the, uh, a long-term development from preschool all, all the way through now. But ever since a few years old, I had inklings that ultimately led me into this direction. So here in fact, I'm holding, holding a, a relic from this period. I'm standing in front of my uh, uh, Montessori school, it's called. And Montessori, Montessori school, by its, by its nature, it has different stations that allow for students to choose where they wanted to uh, learn each day. And as the story goes, well, at least according to my mother, as the story goes, for two years straight, every single day, I only went to the international station. And apparently, I brought home a different cutout of a new country <laughs> literally every single day. The situation in the end ultimately got so bad to where my mother almost took me out of the school because I was literally learning nothing else but what Australia's borders and Spain, Spain's borders decided to look like. One could say that this was a very obvious uh, orientation I had towards adventure and wanting to ultimately be in a position where cultural assimilation and understanding were going to be very keys to my success. At this, I 
think, frankly, that every single one of us is the same in this regard. When we're growing up, we naturally gravitate towards different things that interest us, and we're not so concerned about feeling judged, even if we fail. As infants, none of us by definition got training, per se, to walk. But deep down, we all innately know that I should be able to figure out this thing that I see mom and dad doing, and we keep trying with a smile on our face until we get it. But at some point, we change. This idea of, I can do this, or I'm confident that I'm innately smart enough to figure this out on my own, evolves. I was speaking the other day to a friend of mine who teaches students from six or seven years old all the way to 12, 13. And he was sharing that when the students when they're six years old uh, get supplies to draw, all of them are just like super gleefully happy to get the supplies and just have at it. Every single one in the class. But then he says that by the time the students get to about 13 years old and they're presented with the same type of opportunities to express creativity, uniqueness, and ingenuity, all of a sudden he starts hearing sentiments like, oh, I, 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 I can't draw. Or I, I, I can't dance, it's not my thing. In other words, I'm not qualified to try or someone like me shouldn't be able to win. I might be judged. What I find very interesting about this concept is that this idea of I can't didn't blossom from within the children. It was imposed onto them from outside. It was outside forces that dismantled this natural sense of infinitude, this natural sense of I can reach beyond the stars if I stay disciplined and consistent and focused. What I find extremely troubling, therefore, is that there's so many unique problem solvers that could be out there in the world, but are feeling fundamentally discouraged and therefore don't try. What I find interesting as well is that this same sense of imagination that can inspire us to want to draw houses and otherwise be genius in our own rights is the same sense of imagination that can imprison us later in life and lead us to believe that, oh no, that there are certain things that fundamentally I just cannot do. In reality, all we were doing was taking the first steps forward in a direction that proved to be difficult. But of course, every innovation that has ever been done in the history of mankind ultimately, at the beginning, looked like that. And as I often like to say, in order to ultimately get good at anything, we have to be willing to be publicly bad at first. When we too quickly judge ourselves or judge others for missteps when we're trying something new, like I said, we miss opportunities to identify these new problem solvers, and then at scale, the world misses out. An example of my life of navigating this concept was when I was learning French. I started that journey in about sixth, second, third grade, and worked on it all the way through college. And I remember just for whatever reason, I, I just thought it was really cool making new sounds to be able to make new friends with new people. I tried Spanish, but that proved quite difficult. And I remember there was this one moment in high school where there was an otherwise very strong student who kind of chuckled at me because I was trying to uh, pronounce this uh, sentence correctly with a French accent, and the teacher corrected me in the class. And the student leaned over to me and said, she says, you know, you don't need the accent in order to get an A. I remember in that moment feeling so shocked and kind of embarrassed, because uh, yeah, many of the other students weren't necessarily um, trying to master the accent like I was. But I knew even in that moment, even in being silent in that moment, that there has to be some kind of value to this quirk about me. I just knew in my gut that there has to be something, something worthwhile about this. So whereas, of course, in the US, it's not so popular learning foreign languages, or at least taking them very, very seriously, I just knew in my gut that ultimately, later on in my career, this would pay off. And ultimately, it did. So it wasn't until a few years later I was expanding a, uh, an organization that I started in college. I was expanding it to Senegal, and I had a French bureau right there. But then, even more so, when I moved to Morocco, when I was helping to start an investment fund to invest in startups. I realized in this experience, interesting, this particular quirk of mine where I was just really interested in what otherwise is often considered in the, in the US to be a secondary study of foreign language was specifically the reason why I was selected to be the investment director at this fund, one of one of the few reasons. And what made me so excited is that interesting, I, I can find different pockets like this that uniquely celebrate the fact that I know French and English. And I realized kind of in going through this process that there's this idea of, in order to learn how to orient ourselves in the direction of a right fit, 
we have to necessarily unlearn the assumptions that we had that constricted us from before. And they're often so conscious when they restrict us. We need to dismantle these coffins that we place our imagination, our human individuality, our creativity in, and that often end up killing the most precious parts of us. So technically, I started finding my spark short in preschool, and I navigated a bit and it evolved through French and not. But it wasn't, it wasn't a straightforward path. It wasn't super linear going from graduate school all the way down to running my own company. There was a kind of yo-yo effect where I saw a lot of my peers who so I graduated school with going into management consulting, finding ways of increasing margin for corporations and so forth, or taking on debt to go to business school. And I thought, interesting, for the path that I want to take, the door seems to be open when I just lean into it. But for others, it seems like they need to do this. And I, I, I struggled with this for a while. Do I actually need to, do I need to switch over here, or do I stay steadfast in what I think to myself to be my truth? And fortunately, not only did I do that, I doubled down and exploring what are actually, in addition to French, what are other things that might be unique about me that could be uniquely advantageous in this career that I'm trying to build in Africa that perhaps weren't evaluated or, or, or appreciated in other environments before. One of them in particular ended up being that I'm black. In the US, whereas you, know, you, grow, you grow up as, as a black guy, constantly just being aware of the, of the necessary challenges that, that you are going to experience in, career, in your career. I realized that in managing largely black engineers and designers on teams in Nigeria and Kenya, this was like a unique kind of point of connection for me. Interesting. Once again, something that could have otherwise been considered a unique disadvantage in the US in, in this particular context was actually a unique key for me in Africa. I realized that for really every single one of us, there's a special package of magic that's in us that is only a disadvantage if we're trying to force it into a place where it's not supposed to be. As I advanced and felt appreciation for these unique attributes that bring to the table, I realized as well that we can focus on, that when we focus on being who we truly are as well, everyone around us also benefits. When we focus on, this is just me unabashedly, take it or leave it, and we allow for those who aren't about that to filter, filter themselves in and out of our life, collectively as a unit, all of us end up being happier because we're all living more closely in our truth. I've also, in addition to my, you know, these, these different experiences I had in my own life, I've also been inspired by countless examples of Senegalese, Moroccans, Nigerians, and so forth in my time in Africa. So here are the founders of the company that I worked at in Nigeria. I absolutely love this story. So, this, is, this was a homegrown paints company that started from nothing. It started at a time where there weren't many startups, and there certainly, there, there, sorry, weren't, weren't so many startups in Nigeria, and were certainly not, there weren't any examples of massively successful tech companies out of the country that really got to exit. This company, however, managed to go from zero to selling for about $200 million just a, quarter, just a, just a couple of years ago. What I love the most about this story is that, despite the lack of any precedent, these two Nigerian founders who went to a Nigerian local university leveraged their computer science degree, their tenacity, and most importantly, their proximity to a problem that was affecting a lot of people that otherwise was a secret to others. And I'll repeat that again. They, they leveraged their proximity to a problem that was affecting a large underserved community, and they leveraged that in and of itself as a privilege. Now, some may try to reduce these guys' story as, oh, this is, just the, this is just the nature of Nigeria's work culture. It's just super intense. And I can appreciate that argument. I used to work there. However, I think this is an overly simplistic understanding of the struggle that it took to build this company from zero all the way to almost a quarter billion dollar exit. I think it fundamentally has to do with the mentality the founders chose to have. And again, this idea of not just assuming, oh, there's somebody maybe in San Francisco who could do this problem better. But we live in a country that is, say, two, one is two-thirds the size of the U.S. population. We live in a continent that, is, that, that, that has 1.4 billion people in it. And we know that we can solve this, this problem that we see affecting a lot of merchants across the continent, even though nobody else is building just yet. To be fair, especially at the time as well, it was customary for a lot of Nigerians who had the opportunity to, to work at foreign corporate corporations, whether it was to navigate to Europe or to the U.S. or work at outposts of those companies in Nigeria. But these guys had the audacity to live in their truth and what they knew was clearly apparent to them instead of abiding by convention. 
despite the fact they felt a riskier calling vitally into their truth, they ended up they ended up seeing an extraordinary success, not just for themselves and their employees, but really for the rest of the continent as well. And I can also just emphasize that from my time in DC, I know as a fact, a lot of the most exciting opportunities in the world are usually hidden in situations like this. Another example of bucking convention and then focusing on breaking down the problem to see how is it actually feasible comes from my current chapter in Kenya. So Kenya is a country that is an extraordinary country. However, it sadly is still going through a lot of a lot of economic disparity. In a country of about 54 million people, there are only roughly 800,000 individuals officially that have $1,000 or more in their bank accounts. The average income of the average Kenyan is about $200 a month, and to buy a plot of land, to, to get into real estate, to buy an acre of land, costs about $3,000 plus. Now. In such, a, in such a situation, someone, say, like a motorcycle taxi driver, may just assume that, oh, well, owning land for me is just not going to be feasible. Period. It's only going to be tied to the economic need. But this story here, I absolutely love as well, because it illustrates this idea of those who leaned into the truth that they, know, that they knew themselves was true, and they ended up finding success. So there's a group of 10 motorcycle taxi drivers, in Kenya they call them boat drivers, who got together and just decided that they were going to save one dollar a week. Not even a dollar per day, one dollar per week, in order to ultimately get to the goal of buying land and building homes for themselves and their families on it. It took them a while, it took a lot of discipline and consistency, but ultimately, just like the Nigerian founders, they chose to see the fact that they were able to access asset financing to acquire motorcycles, one. Two, they're able, they have the freedom of mobility, they're able to move to big cities, where they, where they were able to earn more rides per day. And three, they're in a profession that had a lot of similarly earning peers around them, such that they had a lot of options as far as people to save with. All three of these, they, they leveraged as unique privileges to the situation to ultimately be able to buy this land. So in conclusion, I encourage each of you to consider what are unique traits about yourself that you might have, and thinking back through your own history, you might, you might have neglected or in thinking about perhaps different frustrating moments, uh, moments perhaps like my own where you express um, some form of ingenuity or some, some kind of desire to change the world in a certain way and you're met with frustration or otherwise ridicule. What are moments like that where you just assume that, oh, th th there can't be a contribution that I can make in, in the world according to this type, and instead I have to abide by convention? Those moments just there, might themselves be the keys that you need in order to actually pursue a much more rewarding path beyond convention. And I would say, if you haven't found your, your special spark yet, that is okay. For today, just remember that it is a win, remembering that there is something special within you, that if you channel, and channel it in the right direction, can open incredible doors. I'll also say, it doesn't have to be so grand that it necessarily changes the lives of millions. I think it's, it's one of the myths I find annoying with the cyber space. Each of us in our own corner of the universe can, of course, impact on change. And I also think it's important to highlight that many of the greats throughout history, the likes of Martin Luther King, Van Gogh, Jesus Christ even, didn't necessarily see recognition for following their truth while they were alive, while they were alive. Instead, they got, they got notoriety after they were gone. But that idea was immaterial to them to following their path when they were alive. I think we can, we can look to examples like these as a new start. And so in closing, a final encouraging word, just a reminder that our time, of course, here is very limited. So we necessarily need to have the courage to reject dogma which in my view is, is feeling forced to live with the results of other people's thinking, encouraging us to go into convention when actually we can pursue a path more true to ourselves. And then in finding our own path, in having the courage to follow our own truth, the world necessarily will become better. Thank you.